With just 55 days left until Americans head to the ballots, the presidential race in America between President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden is heating up by the day. President Trump is aiming to win another four years in office with a focus on economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as restoration of law and order. Meanwhile, the Biden camp has slammed the incumbent leader for being lawless and disorderly in handling COVID-19 and the protests against racial injustice in America. Now, for weeks, Joe Biden has led national polls, including most of the key battleground states that President Trump managed to win by a very small margin in 2016. But polls have been wrong before, most notably in the previous election, where Hillary Clinton had enjoyed widespread popularity, but ultimately lost to incumbent President Trump. So how will this race play out over the next eight weeks? For this, we're joined today by Brendan O'Connor, Associate Professor of American Politics at the University of Sydney. It's good to see you this morning. Nice to see you too. We also connect with Doug Bandale a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, specialising in foreign policy and civil liberties, who is also a special assistant to former US President Ronald Reagan. Thank you for joining us again. It's great to see you. Happy to be on. Now, well, let's start with you, Dr. O'Connor. The 2020 race is being dubbed as the COVID-19 election. Now, how crucial is an October surprise with a vaccine for Trump to actually win a second term? I don't think it will make a huge difference. There may be a lot of announcements, but people aren't going to be vaccinated before the election. The COVID-19 is not going to disappear. It's still a massive problem in the United States. The rates of infection, the number of deaths uh, approaching 190,000 deaths, a figure that's just astounding, I think, from most other parts of the world to say. So I think that that will be front and center of Trump's record. Definitely the Democrats will be making it front and center. Trump's defense of his handling of COVID-19 at the RNC convention uh, was not, I think, convincing. So there's no way it's going to go away. Sure, there'll be a lot of publicity from Trump that a vaccine is on the way, that America is going to be the leader in this regard. But I think the damage has definitely been done. And from the outside, from outside of American shores, it seems remarkable that a president can survive the amount of mismanagement that Trump has been involved with during the COVID crisis, not really leading from the bully pulpit, rather sh sort of shrinking from his role as president. So you, won't, you don't think that it's going to be a shot in the arm, a boost for President Trump necessarily. Well, what are your views on this, Dr. Bandau? If there is a uh, surprise vaccine in October, do you think this would compromise Biden's campaign? Well, it would certainly be useful for Trump to be able to say, we're heading out of this crisis. My administration took the lead. We've gotten a vaccine sooner than others expected. But I wouldn't overplay that. I think the challenge for Trump is, you know, he did mismanage the uh, COVID crisis. He wants people to think ahead. He wants people to think about the future, that an economic recovery is coming. And he also wants to play against uh, Biden. In many ways, this is like the last election. It's people voting against the other candidate. There are many Republicans who don't really care for Trump's record, but they're very nervous about a fairly left-wing Democratic ticket, especially if it carries the U.S. Congress. So I think the campaign's going to get much more negative, and that's going to be the focus of the issues. Well, the, the, Trump's strength has been um, the economy, and Dr. O'Connor, Trump has, of course, been focusing on recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as restoring law and order in America. But do you think this is a convincing enough strategy? And how do you think it really compares to Biden's plan for the economy? Well, I think Trump has put a lot of stock in the share market, clearly, the numbers. But, I mean, people vote more, I think, on their employment on how they're feeling financially. And I think Doug is right that it will be a campaign of negatives like last time, but Biden's negatives aren't as high in the polls as Hillary Clinton's were. I mean, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were two of the most unliked people in American politics to ever run against each other, where Biden, I think, has a slightly sort of, has a more positive image uh, with the American public. He's not had that history that Hillary Clinton had in the 1990s, where she was very disliked. And in some ways, it was remarkable that she was ever able to become a, a serious politician. From that point, she did improve her kind of standing in the public. So I think clearly, uh, 
Trump will try to run on an economic recovery and say that this is his strength, but the figures aren't particularly good in terms of growth rates, employment rates. So once again, it will be wishful thinking into the future. And this time he's got a presidency to run on. That's the problem, the big difference from last time. He's got a four year record, which the Democrats can really hone in on rather than, well, this is what Trump might do, which last time no one, you know, people had, a, I think, a fairly good idea that he was going to try to build a wall and a trade war with China. But people I don't think would quite knew how seriously to take Donald Trump, where this time there's a record to campaign on or against. And Dr. Van Dahl, do you think the Democrats have a strong enough case against Trump? Do you think their uh, election strategy will be successful right now, turning this election effectively into an anti-Trump campaign? Well, that's their most effective uh, you know, campaign. I mean, Joe Biden has been around in American politics for 47 years. I mean, this is an ultimate establishment person. This is not somebody who's kind of a bright new thinker, has new ideas. I mean, this is someone indeed who looks and acts in many ways very old. So he's not that attractive a candidate. It's critical, as Brendan indicated, that there you don't have the same negative sentiments, but there's not a lot of positives for him. <laughs> the main positive is he's a decent human being and he's not Donald Trump. So I think they will emphasize that. Many of the policies he's picked up to satisfy the left wing of his party probably are not popular among many moderates in America. So he wants to be very careful pushing those hard, those he's using to bring Democrats in. I think the focus on Donald Trump is the obvious one. Trump is a very divisive figure. He's turned off a lot of people. Democrats want to keep the focus on him. And Dr. Bandal, well, at the same time, President Trump, he has alienated some Republican mm -hmm. voters. So what do you think his strategy really should be in the next eight weeks? And Recently, there have been a string of books that have been published that heavily criticized the president. So how do you think he should really uh, sharpen up his presidential strategy here? In a sense, what those books say is nothing new. If at this stage you didn't know what Donald Trump was and what he was like and what his character was, you haven't been paying attention for almost four years. So I, I don't think these books add very much at this stage. You know, his focus has to be to scare Republicans, essentially, to vote for him, even if they don't like him. And that, I think, as we get close to the election, there's going to be a lot of emphasis on, well, Democrats might take the Senate as well. If the Democrats control Congress and the presidency, what will they do? Where, in essence, he will say, you may not like me, but after me, it's the deluge. You know, you'd better vote for me to stop this from coming. That, I think, is his best chance. And there are only about 12 states that are really undecided. He needs to win most of those to win the presidency. It's a very tough you know, task for him to do, but it's possible. So the election is not over. How do you see the possibility, Dr. O'Connor? What do you think President Trump's strategy really should be with less than two months until the big day? Well, Trump has obviously decided that law and order is going to be front and center apart from the economy. He's clearly, I think, trying to, in, in, in some instances, increase uh, conflict between the police and protesters by going to places where there is already sort of high tension in the air. So this is a strategy in some regards taken from the Richard Nixon playbook, Donald Trump playing to this issue of law and order. The polls don't suggest, though, it's working. I mean, in a recent poll, only 9% of Americans said that law and order was the chief issue. Most of them, not surprisingly, thought that it was COVID-19 that was the big issue. So Trump, as you said, needs to get onto this issue of a virus um, vaccine. And he, I think, needs to, as we saw at the Republican Party convention, try to attempt to tell people a story that's more empathetic about him. And that was, I think, very stark at the convention, was an argument, well, Trump might have come across as rather brash, maybe a little nasty, but his family was up there saying, look, he's not that bad a guy, uh, which is kind of a remarkable thing to watch. But this kind of mellowing of Trump uh, that we saw in the con at the con Republican Party convention, whether he can do that on the debate stage, I I'd be surprised if he did. I mean, that's, his, I think, his hope that he can get Biden into sort of difficult positions in the debates. But I don't think a place to type for Donald Trump to come out in the debates and say, look, 
I'm more empathetic than you think I am, uh, particularly when he, I think, be very tough on Joe Biden, name calling and the rest of it, as he did with Hillary Clinton. So with Trump, there's always, you know, there's always the, the message his team wants him to have and the, the way that Donald Trump behaves. And they're often not in the same place, those two strategies. Exactly. Well, the presidential debates you mentioned, Dr. O'Connor, they are um, about three weeks away. And it seems that more Americans believe that President Trump will fare better in the presidential debates than his rival Joe Biden. What do you think about this? And uh, what do we currently know about the two people, the two men as debaters? Well, Trump was surprising in the debates against Hillary Clinton in a sense that they weren't debates. I mean, Trump just got on there and said whatever he wanted to in regard to many questions. He didn't answer the questions. Some people have said the debate was a bit like a high school debater in Hillary Clinton versus the comments section in a newspaper article, <laughs> that Trump was in some ways kind of trolling Hillary Clinton's comments, but not really responding to the questions. And not surprisingly, because he said things which were more electrifying and more alarmist, he got the attention. The news clips were all Donald Trump's kind of one-liners against Hillary Clinton and, uh, and moving towards her and his posturing. So I think the Biden team will have this dilemma of, do they go down to Trump's level of name calling or does, as Michelle Obama likes to say, do they stay high? Do they not engage with the kind of bickering that Trump wants to sort of bring the debates down to. So they'll be fascinating to watch, but they're not really debates in many regards, their performances and how to, um, how to debate Donald Trump, I think is incredibly difficult. And Dr. Banda, what do you make of this? Who do you think will fare better in the debate? Do you think Donald Trump will dominate it basically with his one-liners and his um, name calling basically? Well, it's hard to imagine him not being Donald Trump. I think Brendan's right. I mean, the point is, it doesn't matter what they scope out for his strategy. I have trouble imagining that he will not just break forth. It's just part of him. I mean, he lost on, on points. He lost the debates. I think that's right. They really weren't debates with Hillary Clinton. But that doesn't mean that he lost politically. You know, he made the points of issues. I mean, I think people appreciated he, he's the challenger. He was representing them. His problem now is he's president. He's not running against the establishment. That just makes it harder. And I think it's right. It's not sure what you know, Biden will do. The critical thing is Biden needs to not have a mental lapse. When he's out on the campaign, there are times he says some very strange things. You know, he doesn't want that in a debate that everybody's watching. Otherwise, I would think on points he'll win. It's just not clear to me that's a political win, even if he wins it on debaters' points. And of course, the US elections, the rest of the world is watching very closely, including here in South Korea. And Dr. Bandar, what do you think a Trump or Biden win will mean for the future of US-Korea relations or the US engagement in the Korean Peninsula? Will there be an immediate change or impact in policy? My guess it'll be a fairly significant change. I would expect the Biden administration would move back in many ways towards the Obama administration policy towards Korea, certainly towards the ROK. I think that they would try to settle the SMA and negotiations, that they would want to strengthen the alliance, put disagreements behind them. Uh, North Korea, it's harder to know. Uh, Biden has said he'd be willing to meet Kim Jong-un, but with conditions. I think it would be harder to see them moving forward. I would expect less likely to get negotiations with the North. Trump, uh, I think, is likely to pursue the North if he wins. His position on South Korea is much harder to know. He doesn't, I think, particularly care for President Moon. <laughs> He's criticized the alliance. He's criticized ROK military spending. The SMA negotiations have, you know, uh, you know, faltered under him. I don't think those would immediately change. I think he would see himself as being strengthened by having been reelected and would push a fairly hard line, frankly, more towards South Korea than North Korea. It'd be kind of an, it's an odd situation. And for the rest of the world, Dr. O'Connor, how do you think uh, Joe Biden as president would change his foreign policy? Will we see America going back to its status of being the world's policeman? Do you think it's going, it's going to, um, he will improve relations with China? What do you think his uh, main foreign policy changes would be? Well, I think his first step will do be to reassure allies, to say NATO, to the Australians, to the South Koreans, the Japanese, uh, we're your friends, uh, sorry, 
if there's been some difficulty in our relationship over the last four years, uh, it's back to much more normal kind of US alliance politics. The, one of the big questions is how hard he'll push on global warming policy. This was a big issue in the Democratic primaries. He's pledged quite a lot on his platform, not talking about it a huge amount at the convention, but this issue needs to be confronted. The science is overwhelmingly suggests the planet is warming. Uh, so how strong he'll be on that uh, will be an issue for some allies like Australia. Uh, and then on China, he, I think, will, I think, go back to a policy of the Obama administration, but maybe a little more forceful, that things have changed in China. America, I think, has learned some mistakes from its policy on China over the last 20 years. And I think it will be inevitably probably a relationship with more tension even though I think the old hands of American diplomacy will be back in the saddle. There'll be a lot of familiar faces uh, that come with Biden, and that in, really in some ways is one of his strengths and predictabilities, is that we know a lot of the people around him, uh, that it's not going to be, I think, a dramatic departure from fairly conventional American foreign policy on the diplomatic front. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid this is where we'll have to wrap up the discussion today. That was Brendan O'Connor at the University of Sydney and Doug Bandau at the Cato Institute joining us from Sydney and Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for your insights. Sure thing. My pleasure. And to our viewers, thank you for watching. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow here in Korea with some anal analysis on how working from home affects productivity and emotional health. So don't miss that. And in the meantime, have a great day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.